Yay, and we are live. Welcome everyone to another event from our Desert Live series. I am your host, Gabacha Moreno. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'm tuning in live from Santa Fe, New Mexico, land of the Jicarilla Apache and Pueblo peoples. I want to also introduce uh, Desert Live. It is a virtual series of storytelling events, panels, and workshops curated to entertain and inform our outdoor community in relation to Joshua Tree National Park, but also in general for public lands. We like to empower our audience through genuine connections with the culture, beauty, and the issues of the outdoors. We also ensure that all our presenters embody the goals of our program through sustaining a proven record of supporting diversity and inclusion, environmental efforts, and leave no trace principles. The program was launched last year during the pandemic, and it was commissioned by the Desert Institute and the Joshua Tree National Park Association. Tonight, I am really excited to present to you all to Yanina Aldao Galvan, who was born in Santa Fe, Argentina, on a cattle ranch owned by her father's family. She moved to the city of Córdoba with her mom and brother at the age of five. In Cordoba, in Cordoba, she pursued a career in agriculture science following in the footsteps of her father's family. And in 2007, she came to the USA as part of a cultural exchange program. And then she spent the next seven years in Washington, D.C., where she studied ecotourism. And then in Philadelphia, where she worked as an outdoor school instructor for REI. In 2013, she embarked on the Pacific Crest Trail, during which time she fell in love with California's scenic, natural, and cultural resources, and became really passionate about protecting this beauty in the years since that time. She has worked as an intern for Organic Farms and a volunteer for the Owens Valley Growers Cooperative in Inyo County. After moving to Joshua Tree in 2015, she worked as a land steward for the Mojave Desert Land Trust and now is a full-time student at UC Riverside, where she's pursuing a career in plant ecology and evolutionary biology. She is the first recipient of the Minerva Hoyt internship, which has allowed her to devote a full semester of work studying the ecology of various species in Joshua Tree National Park. In 2019, Yanina was excited to swear her oath as a naturalized American citizen. And in this class, she is going to share with us the and kind of, I, I like the way you put it, Yanina, when you said um, modern recipes of the ancestral basket. So we're obviously here to learn about cooking with native, native plants. And she's going to guide us through the sustainability and the ethics in foraging and gathering of native plants we're going to learn some tips on how to use some of them in the kitchen and we're also going to get a handful of recipes um, perhaps even with some medicinal twists and i'm really excited to hand it over to yanina hello everyone um, thank you so much for being here today. I am in Yak Valley, uh, land of the Serrano, exactly where I am, um, land of the Serrano and the Cahuila and the Western Shoshone. I want to uh, take a second to acknowledge that. It is really hot here today. Uh, so I'm glad to be in the air conditioning and sharing this presentation with you. Thank you. Gavacha, and thank you, Joshua Tree National Park Association, for this opportunity. And I'm going to get started on the presentation here. And um, first of all, I want to say I'm not a chef. I'm not a chef, and I don't really know how to cook very well. I'm mostly a plant ecologist and a researcher. So today, because of this um, online interaction, I did it kind of like a lecture, but it would be nice if at some point we can gather and have more like a cooking class or even normally I would do a hike with people. Uh, but so today I wanted to e emphasize mm, more the active principles or like the active substances of plants and why they are important and why it is important to start 
cooking with native plants and start transforming our agriculture in general. So um, here I have a little photo in the beginning. This is actually a traditional uh, basket that is it's in my house. And these are different, many different pods of mesquite. There are many different species of mesquite. And since I saw there on the chat, people are coming from a lot of different places. So I'm going to try to talk about the plants from a, a more of a generic point of view, plants that grow in California, but not species specific that are in the Mojave Desert. Okay, so here, why use native plants? Why do I want for you to cook with native plants? I obviously have an agenda, and that agenda is for people to start, A, growing the native plants in their yards, B, um, I want also maybe for um, agriculture in California to start changing from industrial agriculture to more of a food forest, more of a uh, use of native plants. Native plants save water. We already know that we've been in a drought here in California for a long time. They reduce the risk of wildfires because they're adapted, so they remain green for longer. They don't need any pesticides, don't need any herbicides, fertilizers, all the things that are listed here. Um, another thing, they don't really take that much time. So you get more time to go play and less time to be in the garden. So I started um, cultivating native plants in my garden because I got tired of fighting with the rodents. So that's my story. And that's how it started. Um, so this is kind of like a preview of our, my next slide, which is going to be where to collect. Obviously, if you're not growing your own plants, but you want to go collecting, there are many different places to go collect. Here is a photo of the Palm Springs Airport parking lot. This is, to me, the greatest place to go collect mesquite pots. A, because they need for us to clean it up, and B, because we need the pods, and they're going to throw them away. So we can just go to parking lots like the Vons parking lots, Walmart parking lot, and they there are plenty of native plants where you can actually gather the pods or the fruits and use them in your kitchen. And you don't need to go into the wilderness and collect and harvest um, without really knowing what you're trying to collect. Here is just, this is the only plant there is at the parking lot. So this is a great place to go collect. And why do I say that? Um, first of all, you cannot, collect in the national park. So I definitely don't want to see hordes of people going into the national park and collecting or harvesting plants because they're going to get arrested. They're going to get a fine. So you cannot go collect there. So you can collect at a private property. If you know someone with a lot of acreage and they give you permission, you can collect there. You can collect in the BLM land, the Bureau of Land Management. A permit is required to collect there, so you would need to go to your local office and collect. Um, so, but one of the guidelines is they're going to tell you up to five tons. That's a lot. If you don't really need that much, if it's just for your own use, I would say good guideline is to collect ten percent of every plant and look for a good population of plants. So never collect from rare and endangered species, for instance, and collect only what you need. Uh, but you can go collect, or you can grow your own. Well, um, 
So one of the re one of the important things about collecting is to try to preserve genetic variation. So we don't want to go collect all the fruit in one area. We want to collect space and, and um, the multiple individuals. So we're not taking the genetic variation on that particular population. So this is why you need to collect in a place where there is a lot of plants. Creosote is a good example because there is a ton of creosote everywhere. So that's a good plant to go collect. Um, or like in the parking lot at the Palm Springs Airport. There's a ton of plants there. They are native ours, which means they are native plants, but that have been grown to for landscape. So you're not really damaging the genetic population of Palm Springs collecting at the airport. Um, another really important issue is avoid collecting any fruit or seed or part with insect infestations because you may bring them back to where you're coming from, therefore creating some undesirable um, issues. And mostly insect infestations would be in, on the ground. Any, any part of the plant that have insect infestations would be on the ground. We don't have a lot of issues here in the desert. Coastal areas have a lot more issues. So you live in the coast of California, San Diego, LA, you will have to pay more attention to that. Obviously, if you're not from a tribal, from a tribe, you cannot collect in tribal land. Be very respectful, respectful of that. Um, so, yeah, some of the tools that you will need in order to go collecting before we get starting, started on what to collect and what kind of species we're going to talk about today. You will need a few bags. You will need a hat, sunscreen, all your normal hiking gear. Um, you will also, I would also recommend to bring labeling material because you're going to want to know where you collected, when you collected. This is really important um, so you don't go back there and collect the same again. These um, apple pipkin bags that are at the right bottom corner, these are great for collecting nopal either in your property or somebody else's property, um, cacti, because they're very resistant. And then paper bags or your reusable grocery bags are really good for collecting um, smaller fruit or seeds or pods because they need to stay dry. Well, another thing before we get started with the actual plants is, um, well, here in the desert, we have a lot of snakes. We have a lot of pointy plants, thorny plants, and we want to preserve our hands and <laughs> our parts. So we need to be wearing long sleeves, long pants, close toe shoes. I was bring water. Tongs are really important for when collecting cacti, bags, knives. Sometimes I bring a cutting board to see if there are any insects. So I would like, cut a little a fruit and cut it and then see if there are insects or disease. And if there is, then I won't collect for from that plant or I won't collect from that population at all. So sometimes you have to be okay with turning around, you know. Um, when collecting, you want to make sure that you, I always have a little prayer before I go, before I collect. First of all, I ask permission to Mother Nature and I say, this is for me and thank you so much for everything that you have given me. 
do whatever you want, whichever. But it's really important to create that relationship with with nature and know that you are a visitor and know that you are there taken away from the animals, the other animals. And so you need to be aware of that. So only take what you need. Um, in order to know what kind of plants are edible and use, medicinally useful, there is really no substitution for the elderly and for the elder knowledge. You can bring all the books in the world. You can go to 500 different universities, but nobody is going to give you the knowledge than a person who has lived in that area most of their lives, who learn from their parents, who learn from their grandparents, who learn from their ancestors. That's honestly the best source of knowledge. And this is where I've gotten my knowledge here in the desert, is from other people, not from books. Uh, just following people that have lived here forever, that have worked here forever. Um, having a field book is good, like the Falcon Guides. And I have a list of resources at the end, so you can see uh, which books, uh, which websites and everything. But yeah, do get a book if you're not a, a botanist. It's really nice to have the photos so you can look at the plants. But before you but before you go alone, I would say go with someone first. Um, if you when after you go with someone, you want to go alone and you want to collect a plant for food or for medicine. These are like, let's say you find yourself hiking and you want to try something. I would recommend that if you don't know, don't try it. But if you really want to, like the way that I do it and my professor of ethnobotany taught me was, um, first of all, if you're looking at a fruit, at a berry, do you see like the, the bush, the shrub? covered with berries well if it's covered with berries that means that nobody's eating them so if nobody's eating them they're probably poisonous that's something to, to look into um cut a little piece of the plant maybe with gloves or with tongs or with a, your shirt smell it does it have a pungent odor or does it have a minty odor? So this is something that is better learned in person. Uh, but there is a very distinctive odor between poison and medicine. And a lot of the things, so these are the volatile organic comp compounds that the plants use as adaptation for their, um, against the insects, against the herbivory, these, uh, these compounds are what we use for our medicine and for our food. This is what makes broccoli stink. That's actually good for you. It's sulfur and it's good for you. Um, but you want to be able to distinguish the two different types of smell. One way to do this safely is to go with someone who already knows and they will teach you and then you can get that. Another test that I do sometimes when I don't know a plant is I smash a little leaf or I break a little bit leaf or flower or fruit and then I rub it on my forearm and then I wait for 15 minutes for a reaction to see if, I'm a, if I have an allergy. If there is any type of like rash or redness it's probably poisonous. It probably has some poison in it, so I won't eat it. Um, again, if you're unsure, then you could take a little bit and then see what happens. But before you eat anything, make sure you know what it is and make sure, and if you're not sure, go, go
go with someone that knows better. So now it's time to talk about the plants. I was going to add native um, names to the plants, but I decided not to do it because there are so many throughout California that I didn't really want to um, offend anybody uh, fa favoring one name over the other. And there are so many names. So I decided to stick around with the English name and a scientific name. The first name in the scientific name, the prosopis, is the genus name. And the SPP means species, any species. And the reason why I do that is because I've been throughout California and there are many numerous species. Also in Texas, there are other species. So, and you can use most of the prosopis, all the prosopis in the Americas, all the mesquites, you can use the pods and eat them. So I just leave, I just have left the species uh, for all of the plants out so we can, we can consume anything basically. Uh, why did I choose this plant? And also you will see the recipes are on the ebook. So I haven't, I'm not going to like show you all the recipes or how to cook. I'll give you the ebook and you can try them yourself. Um, but why do I choose this plant for this particular presentation? Well, first of all, it's easy to grow. You can have it in your house. It's drought tolerant. It fixates nitrogen and it gives you shade. So it creates the possibility of other uh, plants around it. This is a great plant, great tree to grow yourself. Also, you can find flour or meal of mesquite pods, which is what you would be eating, the pods, um, readily available at the supermarket. So it's not a big deal. Uh, the mesquite is rich in magnesium. Uh, it's actually good, really rich in protein, minerals, and it's kind of like a pH balancer because of the uh, low glycemic index, and it is high in fiber. I grew up eating mesquite in Argentina. It grows everywhere in Cordoba, where I am from. And when I came to California and I saw it here in the in the desert, I immediately wanted to try the pods and see if they tasted the same. They do. I started making my cakes with it, just like the way that my mom used to make them. And it tastes exactly the same. Uh, so I started investigating a little bit more this is definitely not an ethnobotany class, but if you want to learn more about the uses of the mesquite in the past, you can look at the what? What's going on? You can look at the ebook and then the additional resources. But one of the things that we used to do back in the house, uh, we were roasted first roast the pods in the oven or the grill outside in a fire, perhaps a fire with like a grill on top, uh, toast them. If you have um, a ways to like toast coffee, that would be the best way to toast them. Uh, if not, that's fine. And then you can grind them. You can grind them with a grain grinder and you can choose whether to grind them fine and make them into a flour that is gluten-free and then you can it's great for baking um so you can if, if you're v if you're gluten-free you want to try really good baking substitute this is great flour to use if you're a baker if you like to drink coffee but you don't want to do the caffeine but you just like that flavor this is a great pod also a great plant to make a coffee like beverage you can drink it hot you can drink it cold 
and it's so much better than coffee. It doesn't have caffeine though, so it won't give you the the jolt, but it it will taste just like it. Um, you can grind it fine and then make it into a really fine powder and use it in your smoothies, which is what I do every morning. If I don't want to have coffee, I make myself a mesquite smoothie uh, with raw cacao. You can just take a pod and eat it, that too, clean it up. Um, again, this is a great tree to have in your yard overall. Oh, okay. Creosote. Why don't you stay? Okay, there you go. Creosote. Uh, if you live in the desert, you are probably familiar with this plant, the creosote. Now, the creosote is not necessarily edible, but it is a medicinal plant. And I included it in this presentation mainly because I wash my hair with it and I use it a lot and it's great for salves. And we are going to go over the different glossary, the different words that I've been, I, I have been using today. But some of them to think about is you have like infusions, you have decoctions. So, the way to use the creosote is through a decoction, which is basically just boiling the leaves in order to extract their VOCs, their compounds. And there is a little bit of a time. You need to have a precise time for different plants when you're doing a decoction because if you overboil something, it could decrease their effectiveness, their efficacy. So you want to make sure that you boil leaves or roots or plant parts in a decoction at the right temperatures. Um, this is your typical creosote scrub here in the desert. Oops. Uh, sorry, this is very, very uh, sensitive, my computer. So why did I choose creosote for this presentation? First of all, it's everywhere. So I'm not afraid that you will over harvest it. And Plants in general like it when you groom it a little bit. It's good for them to get harvested, to get their branches trimmed um, with control and with moderation, of course, but it's good for them. Animals do this all the time. The bunnies will gnaw on the barks at the bottom. So tending to your yard or tending to the wilderness is, a practice, is an ancient practice. You just have to know how to do it. But for the creosote, we have a lot of VOCs, compounds that are antimicrobial and antifungical. And you can get creosote oil, essential oil, from companies. Um, make sure that it's creosote larea tridentata oil and not the tar that also has the same name but you can get the oil and then make your own salves. You can make your own, uh, you can put it in creams, you can put it in uh, shampoo base, uh, you can put it in, in your conditioner base. Uh, it's really great for cuts and scrapes. You can also do, do salves yourself by, boy, by putting the leaves into a, an oil and then put it in, in a water bath and you will have to boil it for a long time but that's another way to extract all the VOCs 
not essential oils. You need a steel in order, in order to do essential oils. But in order to do the, the salves, you can just get some of those VOCs into the oil. Um, and then you have to remove the trans material, of course. But you can use, this is one plant where I would say, well, I would honestly not take it internally, but just in case any plant that I will, that I'm talking about today, if you're pregnant, stay away from it, except for the nopal and the mesquite. Anybody can have that. I mean, in Argentina, um, in where my mom lives, the moms, they give their babies, they bottle feed them um, mesquite juice, like that coffee drink that we were talking about. So they do that all the time. But here for creosote, which has some different kinds of VOCs, I would say if you're pregnant, if you're a child, or if you're a mom breastfeeding, just don't take it internally. But you can still use it in your salve for, you can use it in your, uh, to cure athlete's food, scrapes, burns, uh, anything, any burn uh, is basically like after your skin has sealed, you can start using the salve. Okay, manzanita. So manzanita, this grows in the inter transmontane ecosystem. So if you live in the Pioneer Town area or the cooler areas of Joshua Tree and Yucca Valley, you can have this in your house. Um, I use the berries. And I make a cold press cider. So the so there the first photo, the manzanita, that's ready to harvest. That's the color that you want it. That's actually a little overdue. You want it a little bit less burnt orange. You want it a little bit more yellow to harvest that. I have a friend in Idlewild who has a lot of acreage and has a lot, a lot of manzanita, and they came back after one of the horrible wildfires in Idlewild in 2013. And this was one of the plants that recovered the best. So now he had a lot. So we harvested and made cold cider with this. So this is the flower of the manzanita. You can make a tea with the flower as well with a dry flower if you dry it out. There is some energetic things about the flower. I'm not gonna get into it right now because we still have a lot of plants to go through. Um, but if you wanna look it up, the flower essence of the manzanita, it's supposed to have some self-love, energetic healing properties. I don't know. I haven't, um, I haven't really experimented much with that to give you like a scientific um, result. The rest of the, of this stuff that I'm talking about, I had the occasion to partner up with a pharmacist, with a holistic pharmacist and a homeopath and um, all of these properties and print and active substances in these plants, they have been ex extracted by biochemists and by pharmacists um, and they have been tested. So I can talk about all of these active principles with the certainty that I can give you a book and I can tell you, yes, this is the, the VOC, is, this is this, this is that, and this is what it's good for. Um, it's not just, okay, I got it out of the website. No, this is, there is actually um, a lot of research done on these plants, these plants that I chose today for you. 
But the manzanita, again, we have manzanita in Joshua Tree National Park, uh, where I used to work for a while. Uh, but, the, but it grows in like the higher elevation areas. So you need cold weather to get it. The good thing about the manzanita is that the, the fruit, when you make that cider, that cold pressed cider, which the recipe is on that ebook that I'll give you at the end of this presentation, it's really easy. You just basically cover it and then cover it with water and then you dump the water and then you blend it and then you take, remove, you press it. The interesting part about this is that arbutin, which is one of the flavonoids in the manzanita fruit, in the berry, um, has been studied to have a direct action over the urinary infections, the urinary bacteria, the tract bacteria. So it is antimicrobial and antibacterial, but specifically to the urinary tract and the urinary system, also the reproductive system. So if you happen to have yeast or anything in, the, in those areas, you can take this internally or you can do um, like we, we, we call it at home, my mom call it like sit on, you sit on it, you wash with it, with the, with the tea of the manzanita or the, the cider and it will have a direct action over that. You'll be cured from your UTI in like a day or two. Especially if you combine it with a rosemary cleanse as well, like topical. Um, again, do not take internally if you're pregnant, breastfeeding, if you're a child, and before you take anything, always consult your doctor or your homeopath doctor before taking any natural medicines, especially if you're taking something else. Um, what, how can we take this, this manzanita? We can take it uh, through an infusion, which is basically a tea, a decoction, which we talked about with the creosote, which is the boiling of the plant material. Uh, powder, so you can just take the the manzanita, the berry, and then once it's dry, uh, mash it into a powder, and then mix it with water. You can do an extra, you can do a maceration as well, which is different, and then the cold press. Um, so all, those are all the ways where you, uh, that you can take either the flower or the berry. Okay. Maybe I have another nopal. And the nopal is one of the staple foods in the desert. Not just the pads, but also the fruit. So again, the indigenous people, the first people from this area, from Southern California in general, use pretty much every part, use the buds, use the flowers, they eat the buds, they eat the flowers. Uh, we, I normally just eat the pads and the fruit and I try to, I don't, I haven't been very successful growing big plants in my house, but my neighbor has big plants and I have a lot of friends who, who cultivate different species of opuntia, which is the nopal plant. That's the scientific name. But there is different species of opuntia that we will talk about, and I'm not a purist. So if you want to grow a non-native opuntia, by all means, um, a lot of the opuntias are already kind of selected to have bigger stems and more fruit, but they're super easy to grow. So if, um, I haven't been successful because I have a lot of rodents, but they're really super easy to grow. And there are many different species that you can eat. Oh. 
So we have a couple of species that I want to look at is we have a couple of natives to the Mojave Desert and we have natives to other parts of the America. Wherever you live, you can probably grow one of these species easily. You just have to look at where you live and how to, how to grow them. This plant is very rich in protein as well, but mostly on fructose and then potassium and calcium. But even though they have a lot of fructose and glu uh, glucose, there are, they have been recommended to, for diabetic people that have a hard time keeping their glucose level um, up. So you, I like to grill them, it's the easiest way. And I have put in th at the bottom in the resources page, a link to a book that I use that teaches you different methods to clean either the fruit or the pads. Because uh, if you buy them at the farmer's market, like I buy them at the farmer's market from one of my friends and they already clean them for me. But if you're gonna collect them yourself, you are gonna have to learn how to clean them. And the easiest method is to have a knife and take all those bigger thorns out with your with your knife and then grill the nopal to get the glockets out which are the glockets are the little little thorns that you can't see that you're going to get in your skin no matter what so i like to grill them and then after grill them i like to mix them with mango avocado cilantro and lime juice um i have a friend who says that you can so call anything if you just add lime juice cilantro and avocado so there you go. And then the prickly pear or the tuna, you can make awesome desserts. I'm, I'm not gonna get into a lot of these right now because we're almost gonna run out of time. But I have put it in the ebook recipes for both the nopal and the prickly pear and then ways to clean it as well. Okay, Mormon tea or Indian tea, ephedra. Ephedra is uh, conifer, which means it's related to the pines. Uh, this is one in the national park. It is another plant that I wouldn't feel that we would over harvest it. There's a lot of it. You can harvest it anytime. Although anything that you're harvesting the stems or the fruits or the aerial part is better harvested in the morning and anything that you're harvesting the roots is better harvesting in the afternoon uh, it's just the way how the sap cycles in the in the plant and um, during the day and it's just that's another that's for another class but this is what i'm studying right now the circadian uh, rhythm of of plants and how they move different compounds throughout the day and throughout the year but anyways for the mormon tea this is what i use in the fall winter when people are getting sick i have taken it i have given it to friends boyfriends people i love um the only thing that I'm going to say with ephedra is that because it is a, it's an amphetamine, you have to be really, really careful with it. So you cannot take ephedra in a decoction. So we are gonna do a decoction of the ephedra. We're going to boil it for a few minutes with ginger and other um, healing things. And we're gonna make like a, we're gonna make a decoction to, to drink it. And this will, the ephedra is, what you would get on Sudafed, you would you would get it in your regular cough drop, but because the dosage can really be dangerous, it has been forbidden. So in in pharmacy. So you have to be really careful on just drinking just a little bit 
no more than three times. And I would say I only have one cup when I have a cold or, or the flu, not that I don't really get the flu, but if someone gets, if I get the flu or a cold, I would take one cup before I go to bed and then I would be a-okay the next day and then that's it. That's all you need, just one cup mm. and you don't need any more. So again, you have to be careful when you're taking these things. You can't take it with caffeine. You can't take it again, pregnant children, can't take it. And this is like where it, like if you have a cold, it's like an EpiPen for your cold. It's going to relax your bron uh, your bronchioles. It's going to create increased circulation to to your brain, your lungs, your muscles. So you're feel you're gonna feel like a champ after taking one of these the next day. Uh, but you can't take a lot because then it will create the opposite effect. Yeah. So the recipe is. This is another one that you have to be careful with dosage, so be careful with proportions. So the recipe is in the ebook that will be shared with you. You just basically make a hot toddy. You put a little bit of whiskey, a little bit of lemon, ginger, a little bit of ephedra before you go to bed. Okay. And I just want to get on time here so we can have time for questions but um, I really like cooking with invasive species even more than I like cooking with native plants and why is that because invasive species obviously take away from the native plants so these are some the three main species that I found I in this area and in, in coastal California that are super invasive and you just pluck them out of your yard. The first one is lamb's quarter and I make, you can make an excellent quiche with it, just treat it like spinach, saute with onion, put some egg, make a quiche, great. Uh, or you can just saute lamb's quarter. The second one is London rocket, the mustard, not London rocket, the arugula, but they're basically the same thing. They have the same origin. They're pretty much the same thing, just evolved a little different. So you can use the tender, the tender leaves in the beginning of the spring. I use them all, I think, because I don't have any more coming up. Um, so that's one way to get rid of your invasives. And then the third is red amaranth, which you can just winnow on a basket like the one that I showed you in the beginning and just use it like quinoa. It's very, very, very nutritious. So this one you can also find easily in disturbed soils. They love that. And finally, just a little bit of the glossary again, and we'll give this so you can read it at your leisure, but basically you have tinctures, essential oil salves, flowers, meals, decoctions, and different things that we talked about. These are the, the resources. Whoops. And I just wanted to thank the people that have brought me here. Um, the part botanist, Tom Kane, Tom Rotman, Mandina from MDLT, all of these people that I've learned from, all my mentors. Um, and with that, I want to give 10, 15 minutes for questions. So I'm going to go back here. Thank you so much for that presentation, Yanni. I feel like I learned so much. Uh, I definitely didn't know that Mormon tea was a conifer, so thank you. <laughs> so fun. So fun to learn about all this stuff. Um, so somebody asked if you can make the slides available as well. Yes. Are so you able to share those? Or? Slides, 
are available on the folder that we share. Okay, so I so but yeah, I have yeah, your permission to share with folks. Team, okay, yeah, share the slides and the and the yeah. E so the ebook definitely already shared. So I'm just getting the link. For yes, absolutely, because that resources last. Great. So I just added the link to download the slides. So thank you so much for sharing those, Yanina. That's really yeah. I'm sorry that I went so fast. Generous. There is more to talk. About. <laughs> I know we could we could have a whole series of classes, and maybe let's let's talk about that so we can have a an a robust resource for for our people because everyone seems to be super interested. Yes, and that's only five plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine, right? Like we, we can go down the list and we'll be here for a couple of days. Uh, so the first question is actually a question that I had and I was wondering if you have some good resources or tips to learn about endangered local plants. Yes, so in that resource slide, uh, there is one about calflora with calflora.org. You can check the plants there by genus or by common name, and then it will tell you whether it is in danger or not. Uh, what kind of listing there is, and that's a great resource to look when you want to know about a plant and quickly like go over photos, blooming periods, and that kind of stuff, whether it's endangered yeah. or, not, or not. A lot of the rare and endangered species we don't have a lot of knowledge of. So yeah, callflora.org. Awesome. Okay, so the next question is more of a technical question. Uh, someone that came in late, Adriana came in late and they're what wondering uh, if they can see a play of the a replay of the recording. Yes, the replay is available on the same link as you tune into the live. You can just use that link pretty much until we take it down, which we don't have plans of taking it down. So you'll have access to it for the foreseeable future. Let me see if there are any other questions on the chat. Oh, cool. Ashley Chavez says, I harvested prickly pears from my yard and made a prickly pear granita. We used a hand torch to burn off the prickles. Cool. And I don't think we have any more questions. Um, they're already saying that they love the ebook, so that's wonderful. And if you haven't downloaded that, just check on the chat for the link. Janina, do you have any uh, last thoughts or words that you want to share? Yeah. Yeah. See you can torch the the the, the glockets sorry you're cutting out a little bit there can you repeat that last thought Uh, on the ebook, there is uh, so there. My email is there. So if you have any further questions later on, or if you find a plant and you're like, uh, should I eat this? <laughs> then you can email me, and then um, 
I can help you IDing the plant or uh, you, I can answer questions. And if I don't know, know the answer, which normally I don't know all the answers, uh, I always know something. Oh, I'm saying that my email is on the ebook. So if you have questions, if I don't know the answer, I'll know someone who knows the answer. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, we did have another uh, question come up, which is about the that. creosote for the hair wash. Um, how many leaves would you use in a pot? Or, like, you know, what's your ratio of leaves oh, to water I, for the hair I can rinse? See I see a question here that says, I'm wondering about creosote, how much leaves would you use in a pot of water to boil for a hair wash? A fistful. Hmm. Would you say that's a fistful for like a quart of water or more? For the creosote, a fistful. And also for the Mormon tea, you will use a fistful. Great. Thank you, Yanni. I think we're experiencing some very major delays on the sound and video, um, but not to worry. I think I'm glad the whole presentation went smoothly and we got to hear everything. And I feel like everybody learned a lot, I, including myself. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Everyone, like Yanina said, she added her email to that ebook, so she's oh, been I, that generous that you I have thought access I, uh, to it's a fist chatting ball. with a fist her. Ball. So one fist, <laughs> the amount of your fist. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, stay away from the eyes. Um, Already. So with that, since we're experiencing this technical stuff, but we pretty much already got all the information, I'm going to close us up. Before we head out, I really want to thank the Desert yeah, Institute, the which is the educational the branch of the Joshua Tree National Park Association that's dedicated to bringing educational, cultural, and artistic programs to the field within Joshua Tree like National a Park and its surrounding areas. And of course, also to the virtual space, which is really fun because we get to share with the whole world, right? And just to keep this uh, spirit of learning going, I want to invite you all to sign up for future events. I'm going to drop some links in the chat of places where you can donate, check out upcoming events, um, stay connected watch some replays from previous events. Uh, we have a whole season from last year that is actually free to access. And we also are going to have more upcoming events. So far, the next event that we have planned is for the late um, late August, and that is a Backpacking Meals 101 with the backcountry foodie, Aaron Owens. So I hope to see some of you there. Janina, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm sorry we're experiencing these weird delays and technical difficulties, but this was an awesome presentation. And for anyone who's watching today, you can watch the replay. It's also available for purchase. So you can tell your friends to also go in and buy it and watch it. And they'll also have access to the same materials that you did today. Thank you again, everyone. I'm Gabache, your host, and it was really great to see you today. Enjoy.